The role of nuclear power can be a divisive subject, but it's one worth talking about, because the next generation of nuclear reactors just got a whole lot more interesting. There are over 80 small modular reactor designs and concepts around the world today in various stages of development, but only two are operational in Russia and current world leader, China. As its grid-connected small modular reactor, or SMR, began commercial operation last year, it got me thinking, what's happening inside their reactors? And is it any different to the ones we're trying in the rest of the world? And most importantly, as the nuclear sector continues to grow, can SMRs lower our emissions, or will development costs prove prohibitively expensive? I'm Ryan Innes, and this is a Zero Deep Dive. On average, 10% of the world's power comes from splitting atoms, with France having the highest proportion at nearly 70% of their energy production. So there's a lot of nuclear energy in the mix, and it looks likely to grow, with demand for reliable power with low emissions increasing due to the boom in data centers. Nuclear has low life cycle emissions, about the same as wind and a third of solar, with no carbon emissions during operation, Next Generation Nuclear seeks to decentralize and simplify nuclear power production, lowering generation costs so we can get to net zero and still have continuous power. Small modular reactors are a tenth to a quarter the size of gigawatt scale reactors. They generally produce 50 to 300 megawatts, but work in the same way using nuclear fission. The ceramic pellets of uranium release heat without producing greenhouse gases, but with pellets packed into fuel rods in the assembly, there's a lot of heat to contain. Like modern gigawatt scale nuclear reactors, SMRs are designed with passive safety systems to keep them safe in the event of a natural disaster, for example. This would therefore stop a nuclear meltdown without human intervention. If disaster strikes and coolant stops circulating, this passive safety feature circulates water through convection by a series of chambers, naturally cooling the reactor so it doesn't go into a meltdown and leak radioactive material into the environment. The most common type is a light water reactor, but the world's first SMR to be connected to the grid is actually a high temperature gas cooled pebble bed reactor, also known as HTRPM for short. HTRPM is a 210 megawatt small modular reactor project in China. It's made up of two 105 megawatt reactor modules that, in a world first, began producing power on land in 2021 and started commercial operation in 2023. It uses uranium fuel pellets, graphite as a moderator, and helium as a coolant, which removes the heat generated by the atom splitting nuclear fission. The moderator refers to a material used to slow down the neutrons inside of the reactor. When uranium-235 atoms undergo fission, they release fast-moving neutrons. These need to be slowed down to increase the likelihood of causing further fission reactions in nearby uranium atoms. For China's HTRPM, the graphite moderator encases fuel pebbles and consists of thousands of tiny particles of uranium fuel encapsulated within multiple layers of ceramic and carbon materials. The HTRPM technology is pretty revolutionary in its design, and it's well suited to SMRs because the pebbles, graphite, and helium help create a robust passive safety system. It's also best suited to these small reactors as the helium gas might struggle with the larger heat outputs of a full-sized reactor as helium can't carry as much heat as water. China has achieved something many startups are trying to follow, including Amazon-backed X-Energy. However, China's second SMR project of interest actually uses more proven nuclear technologies. China's second SMR plant, Linglong-1, is well on its way to completion too. It's a multi-purpose 125 megawatt pressurized water reactor, which makes it about the tenth of the size of an average modern nuclear power plant. The Linglong-1 uses water as both the coolant and the moderator to slow down those fast-moving neutrons. The water in the reactor is kept under pressure to stop it from boiling before being pumped into a heat exchanger so it can transfer its heat to non-radioactive water. This water then boils, turns into steam, and, you guessed it, goes to spin a steam turbine and generator. 
The water can then cool and is recirculated for another round. In this process, they used canned motor pumps. These are a special type of pump where both the motor and pump are housed in a single seal unit. The design eliminates the need for external seals, reducing the risk of leakage and improving safety and reliability. The Linglong 1 reactor is designed for a 60 year operational life and in another world first for China, it's the first SMR project to pass an independent safety assessment by the International Atomic Energy Agency and is expected to go into commercial production in 2025. And with things starting to hot up regarding SMRs in other places in the world, it looks like we're gonna start to need a lot more uranium. Over 95% of reactors use uranium. It's the lifeblood of nuclear, which is why Uranium Royalty Corp, which are ticker symbol UROY on the NASDAQ, are so interested in it and have sponsored this section of the video. Uranium is abundant as the isotope U238, but must be refined into U235 for reactors. A ceramic pellet of uranium fuel generates about the same amount of energy as one ton of coal without producing greenhouse gases. Uranium Royalty Corp makes strategic investments into uranium mines, providing the capital needed to help fund the next generation of uranium mining. They then get a royalty on this production and when the mine produces, Uranium Royalty Corp gets paid. The companies they are investing in are using modern methods for recovering uranium, such as in situ recovery, in which uranium is dissolved in place and pumped to the surface, minimizing surface disruption. With the expected increase in nuclear energy, they predict that demand for uranium is going to triple in the next three years. But if demand increases and uranium becomes more expensive, won't it increase the cost of nuclear power generation, the very thing that SMRs are trying to reduce? Well, thankfully, it won't actually have much of an impact because the fuel costs make up only a small fraction of the total cost of nuclear energy production. On the topic of price, SMRs are touted as having great potential to lower the cost of nuclear energy generation, which is the only energy price which is trending up, mainly because gigawatt scale reactors require mega projects that are bespoke and go billions over budget. The idea of SMRs is that because they're modular, they can be built in factories, allowing for standardization so they can reduce the cost of deployment and maintenance and be fitted together to provide flexible power generation in accordance with the needs. But in countries with different economic structures to China, the massive cost of R&D is proving a barrier to deployment. A Monte Carlo simulation showed that in terms of average energy costs, none of the current SMR projects are profitable or economically competitive. But then again, 100% of wind or solar projects 20 years ago would probably have failed the same check too. An Australian report also showed massive price drops expected for SMRs in the next five years. With this trend, it may be that in 15 years time, these SMRs are significantly cheaper. However, one thing is for sure, big tech definitely sees a future in SMRs to feed its power hungry data centers with reliable, continuous power that can help meet their net zero commitments. As well as innovations in technology, there are also innovations in finance that are helping to shape the future of next generation nuclear. Led by nuclear industry veterans on a mission to boost the role that nuclear energy can play in global decarbonization, Uranium Royalty Corp, who is supporting this video, is an investment firm focused solely on uranium. Founded in 2017 with headquarters in Canada, they invest in mining companies by purchasing a royalty or streaming agreement on uranium production. Royalties provide upfront capital to mining companies in exchange for a percentage of the revenue or profits generated from future uranium production. With streams, Uranium Royalty Corp receives a portion of the physical uranium produced by the mining company, which they can then sell on the market. And with ESG risk factors assessed, it helps to continue shaping a more sustainable industry. You can find out more about them at their website, which is linked in the description down below. With low emission nuclear energy, coupled with the advanced safety, modular design, flexible power generation, and small land footprint of SMRs, it's easy to see why big tech is turning to companies in this space. When Microsoft, Google, and Amazon announced massive investments in nuclear, stocks went through the roof. 
Although it wasn't the first, Amazon's recent investments have been a sign that nuclear is hitting a critical mass. Estimates say that data centers worldwide consume around 1% of the global electricity. But one gigawatt sized data centers are becoming more of a reality and their expansion is expected to grow globally by 10% each year. With most big tech companies committing to net zero targets, it seems they've decided a promising route to the reliable energy they need is nuclear. To name just a few, Google recently invested in Kairos and their SMR project, and Amazon is hedging its bets on bringing X Energy's helium-cooled reactor to life. The announcement of Amazon's commitment to SMRs has massively boosted the share price of NuScale, the only SMR in America licensed for commercial production, but has been hindered in financial troubles. Whether or not that will revive the company's fortune long term remains to be seen, but it's an interesting development in how coupled with government support, big tech is providing the kind of stimulus that up until now, only political economies of countries like China have been capable of. It's huge stimuli like this that I think was the reason China was able to deploy the world's first land-based SMR. But what about the downsides of SMRs? We've covered the cost, but there's always the issue of nuclear waste. The highest level waste could remain radioactive for tens of thousands of years, and the best solution we have so far is to bury it deep underground. This should work, but tens of thousands of years is a really long time. Some SMR proponents say that waste management has been improved, and you can even use nuclear waste as a fuel in some reactors. But according to Stanford-led research, most SMR designs will actually increase the volume of waste per unit of energy produced. These are understandably worrying issues, but for me personally, I think it's more worrying to continue on the trajectory of using fossil fuels like we currently are. As for cost saving, well, it was meant to come much sooner than it has. But look at how expensive solar was even 15 years ago. It was completely uneconomical. And now electricity from wind and solar is among the cheapest available. It's my hope that if we were to plot the price of SMR energy over the next 15 years, we'd see a similar trend. But regardless of the exact outcomes of SMRs, it's clear that nuclear isn't going anywhere. All predictions point to the fact that it's going to be a growing sector, and that means the demand for uranium is going to increase. There's a lot of innovation happening in the finance and the technology world, which makes uranium and nuclear very interesting spaces. And another thank you to today's sponsor, Uranium Royalty Corp. You can find them under UROY on the NASDAQ or URC on the Toronto Stock Exchange if you want to follow them there. Or you can go to their website, uraniumroyalty.com, which is also down in the description. And as always, thanks for watching.